Welcome to Profit Boss Radio. I'm your host, Hillary Hendershot, certified financial planner and owner of every money mistake you can imagine. I now run a successful financial planning and wealth coaching firm. I'm here to share with you what I learned turning failure into financial freedom. Profit Boss Radio is all about how women like us are authoring our own lives, rewriting the rule book of money and running incredible businesses. If you like this show, hit subscribe, share it with a friend and leave us that five-star review. Are you ready, Profit Boss? Let's do this. Hey, it's Hillary Hendershot. Real quick before we get to the show, I want to share how you can get my comprehensive and virtual wealth coaching course for business owners. Since I started sharing how I multiplied my wealth from more than $500,000 in debt to accumulating over eight figures in wealth through neuroplasticity, changing my brain about money, lots of you have been reaching out to find out how you can do that too. So this podcast is loaded with lots of great financial advice from both myself and my guests, but I'll confess Profit Boss Radio isn't intended Intended to be a comprehensive or done for you system. That's why I decided to create the money blueprint for business owners. If you want one-on-one access to me, plus all my strategies for learning to command and manifest money, plus your own personalized plan for your business and personal finances, conveniently packaged up into a one-year transformational course, visit hillaryhendershot.com forward slash MBP. The link's in the show notes for all the details. Today, I'm excited to share with you a timeless episode from the Profit Boss Radio Archives. It's a conversation with financial coach and author, Lauren Grootman. Lauren is a consumer savings expert, author, and spokeswoman. She's passionate about helping busy moms create financial freedom for their families, and she runs her business full-time with four kids. She's been featured on the Today Show, the Rachel Ray Show, ABC's Nightline, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, and WNBC New York City. She's the author of The Recovering Spender and Insufficient Funds, One Woman's Journey Out of Debt and Into Financial Freedom. If you're struggling with chronic debt, as so many of my listeners are, this is the episode for you. In today's episode, Lauren shares her story of how she and her family aggressively paid down their seemingly insurmountable debt. Listen to learn Lauren's specific tricks they used to slash their monthly spending and the realizations she had about simplifying her house and her life. If you know you like to spend money, me too, but realize you should rein in your budget and are unsure of how or where to start, make sure to tune into this episode to hear Lauren's tips and so much more. Let's do this. Lauren, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited. You're really the first guest of this type that I've had on the show. And I love Ooh. what you're up to. And you're a media maven. So it, it's great. You're, you're really doing some amazing things. And I can tell you're committed to your campaign and your vision. So would you go back, back in time with us just to start our conversation? Take us to that moment when you realized that you were in debt over your head. What were you doing? What was that like? What happened? Yeah. So I was in debt up to my eyeballs, $40,000 to be exact, running a $1,000 deficit every single month. And I was really at my wits end. I was so stressed out. I you know, losing sleep at night. Around this time, I was married. I actually got married pretty young. We were 21 years old, me and my husband. So, and we had one child at the age of 24 is when we had our first child. Now we have four. And so this kind of all came to head when I was 25 years old, when I realized that, you know, we were in $40,000 with the debt. I couldn't pretend like it wasn't there anymore. And I just really wanted a different life for my family. We wanted more children. We wanted financial security. We wanted to be able to, you know, do things like pay for our kids' college. But yet we were spending all of our savings. We were, you know, even more in getting into such credit card debt. And so that's kind of where I was. This was in back in 2005, 2006, around there. And just really stressed out and just, you know, just wanted to crawl into a hole and just like, snap my fingers and have everything changed for me. So that was kind of where I was. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know. Was there a particular trigger or what put it over the edge for you? What put it over the edge for me was when I had gone shopping one day, went, gone to the mall with one of my friends. And during that shopping trip, I spent, I don't know, a few hundred dollars on clothes that we didn't have, put it on a credit card. And when I got home, instead of bringing it inside, I kept it in the trunk of my car because I didn't want to fight with my husband over the purchase. So 
I left it there. And when he went to work the next day, I got it out of the car and I put it in the closet, took the tags off and just hoped that he didn't notice. (laughs) Okay. So a little bit of financial infidelity there. (laughs) Yes. And so I really, I think when I started doing that and, and seeing the things that were kind of coming up in my heart that I realized that I didn't like doing that. Like my marriage was way too important for me to have this financial infidelity. And so that's when I started to think about coming clean and ultimately decided to come clean to my husband about all the money that I was spending and how much debt we were in because I was handling the money back then. So that's that was like the breaking point for me. Oh, so he didn't know. He didn't know. Yep. Okay. And how'd that conversation go? It actually went fairly well, uh, as well as it could be. I came clean to him and just told him we were in, you know, $40,000 of the debt and I, I needed help. I couldn't, you know, I was balancing, you know, bouncing checks. And, and at that time we were making a good living too. It wasn't like we were making little money. We were making a good living. We had an Audi and we had a custom built house and we had tons of nice stuff in a house full of beautiful furniture. So we, on the outside, we looked really, really good. So when, when I told him, he knew we had debt. He almost didn't want to know how much it was because he knew that I was spending money. And so when I told him, he wasn't shocked, but he definitely was like, okay, I forgive you. Let's, we gotta, we gotta work on this, but we need to work on it together. It's not just me putting the numbers down. You got to stop spending money. And so that was like a, you know, a turning point for me. I had to really decide if I was going to change. Wow, Lauren, this guy sounds like a really good guy. He is. <laughs> He's a very, very good guy. That is not the way most people would react, right? Yeah. Oh, no, totally. Totally not. I feel like I got lucky in that sense. Very good. So there you are, custom built house. You have an Audi, which is probably you own with a loan. I, I'm mm-hmm. just assuming that. Yep. And then you, when you really fully take stock, you lay the credit card bills out, you lay the auto loan bill out, and you know, you can probably leave the mortgage aside because that's quote unquote good debt, but you're looking at right. your consumer debt. And when you face the music, how did it feel? Oh, horrible. It felt horrible. I felt like my life could have been over. You know, it, there was no way for us to pay down our debt with where we were at at that time. And I felt helpless. And I think this is, there's a lot of people, whether you make money or whether you don't make much money that you can be in this situation, you know, one thing happens and you're back to square one, right? Yeah. And we hadn't always been in debt, but we had just made some really stupid decisions. And that's kind of where we ended up. So what did you change first? First thing I changed was getting really real with myself. I needed to figure out that the money that I was spending was not equal to my value system. And so I think anybody at any financial level can relate to this, that you spend your money typically as a reflection of your values. And for me, my values were my family, financial security, faith, you know, my marriage, but yet everything that I was doing and how I was spending my money was against everything that I believed in. If you had looked at my checkbook register, you would have thought that my values were Target and Starbucks and the mall, like eating out and making these extravagant dinners. Target is such a money pit, isn't it? I love Target. Nothing against Target. Not like that big corporation is really worried about my little show, but I can't go in there without spending. It seems like a couple hundred dollars. I know because everything is so stinking cute, right? So so I walk in and that was always a thing for me. I go to Target like multiple times a week to grab one thing and end up coming out spending $200. (laughs) Right. So I'm like, everybody can relate to that right now. (laughs) Target. Yep. And so for me, it was like, I had to really realign how I was spending my money to align with my value system and now start spending money as a reflection of those values instead of the opposite. So that was step number one for me. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. How many steps are there? I don't want to interrupt you. No, it's okay. (laughs) I have lots of steps, but (laughs) I bet you do. (laughs) The most important step was the, was the value system. I had to realize what am I chasing and what are my values and then spend my money as a reflection of that. And so was the Audi part of your value system or how did, what happened to the car? No, actually we sold our Audi and bought a minivan. Look at that. Yep. (laughs) You really overhauled. We really did overhaul. We actually got so brave as to sell our custom built house. And we ended up moving into like a little tiny rental townhouse Uh that, I mean, literally it was so small. We came from like a 3,200 square foot house into a 700 square foot townhouse. (gasps) And we sold everything that we owned because we were just so sick and tired of being broke all the time. And I had just had a complete overhaul with what I 
you know, knew and felt was valuable to me that I just was like, I want to get rid of all this stuff because I don't want to be on stuff anymore. Isn't it funny? Having stuff seems to be get more spending on stuff, like repairing it, cleaning it, keeping it up. Right. It's like, it's funny because it doesn't fill the hole. It just becomes more stuff. Yeah, exactly. And you, then you need new throw pillows for the new couch. And obviously, you know, obviously at Target, because that's where you get them because they're so cute. But <laughs> so, so how do you go from 30, did you say 3,500 square feet? Yeah. To 700 with multiple kids. And this is a two part question. Why did you choose to do that? Given a lot of people would say mortgages is, is good debt. Right. So the thing with us is we wanted to make sure that the purchase, the next house purchase that we made was going to be our forever home. We didn't want to... During this time, we also had a job change where my husband was going to lose his job. And thankfully, he got, you know, on top of the $40,000 worth of debt, he was going to lose his job. We found that out. And then so he thankfully got his old job back. At this time, we were, we were living in South Carolina. He got his old job back in New York, which is where we're from. So we moved back to New York. And instead of buying a house sight unseen or, you know, doing crazy things like that, we decided to rent this teeny tiny townhouse to save up the money to pay down debt. So we were just like aggressively paying down debt, like thousands of dollars a month with being able to move into this tiny townhouse. Because I think the rent was $900 a month. And that included all the utilities and the water. So we didn't have to pay like anything else. Coming from our mortgage of 2000 plus, plus the utilities and all of that, we were able to really see and use like almost $2,000 a month to pay down this debt. So that was one of the major ways that you went from being in the in the red to being in the black mm -hmm. on a cash flow basis. Right, exactly. So we really focused on on that. And then we then started saving up money to make a big down payment on a house that we were going to stay in forever. And we opted to go for a smaller house that was simpler, that we could really, you know, stay in and, and enjoy ourselves. And so we bought that house. We were in the townhouse for a year. And then we bought the house that we're still currently in. Wow. Big choices. I mean, yeah. I, I never say this to people when they start any of my programs, but a lot of people who choose financial coaching actually end up moving. Uh -huh. Like I said, I never say that to them when this, when the, when the thing begins, because, you know, it would just be way too much for them to bite off. But when a lot of people look at what they're spending, it's like the, your two biggest expenses are probably your car and your house. Mm -hmm. Or if you live in, you know, Manhattan, it's transportation in your house. Yep. That's so true. Very good. And your husband is, well, you, we went through a little bit of time here, but he lost his job. Then he got an old job back. So he's working at this point. Right. Yep. And he is an actuary. So he is a numbers guy. Yeah. And so, you know, you can imagine an actuary who deals with money and numbers all day being in this much debt. It was kind of like humiliating for him because his wife had gotten him into the debt. <laughs> Would you just tell people what an actuary does? Oh, gosh, it's like so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could tell you what they do and what they think. Like what they do is they sit usually behind a computer all day. But at that computer, they have massive spreadsheets. A lot of times they work for insurance companies to figure out, you know, they, they develop rates for what people's automobile or insurance policies need to cost based on mortality tables and all this stuff. It's like all this numbers. So they're big numbers, people. <laughs> yes. They're brilliant. And it takes a lot of schooling and testing to get their actuarial degree. So he had been through like eight or nine years of testing and all of that. So he's pretty brilliant. So there you are. Are you back in New York at this point? When do you take on teaching and writing about debt? Yeah. So we were back in New York about a year. Actually, no, I, I started teaching about debt. And, you know, one of the big things that we did to get out of debt was learn how to drastically save on our grocery bill. So one of the things that we did is we cut our grocery bill down from a thousand a month down to 200 a month. And I fed us for $50 a week for about three years. Oh. And, Yes, that was like a big thing for me, like learning how to coupon and meal plan. And I just said, you know, I would, could, I could spend the money on food, but I would rather pay down debt. So let's just learn how to eat really simple. And so we did that. We learned how to cut our grocery bill back a lot. I'm sure you've written about that a lot, but would you just give us the high level on how you cut your gr grocery bill 80%? Yeah. So big thing is I 
anything that was a toiletry or anything like that, I got for free using coupons. That I learned how to do that. And then I would do a lot of freezer cooking and meal planning. So I teach that on my website now how to you know, make 20 meals for $150 that are freezer meals and go right in the freezer. So, you know, any busy mom can relate to not having enough time to plan out your dinners, right? So that's one thing. And then I just really learned how to strategically shop the grocery stores and put put some time into it. I saw it as an hourly wage, you know, instead of going out to work at a minimum wage job, I decided to stay at home and save money instead. So I always looked at it as an hourly wage, whereas if I could sit down and plan, you know, really plan and stock up on deals and spend about two to three hours a week, if I were to save $100 that week on groceries, then I was just making $50 an hour. So I always tried to like challenge myself on how much money I could make by couponing or meal planning. And to me, it was better than going out and getting a part-time job where I was making money and then paying taxes on those earnings. This was kind of a tax-free way for me to make money at home. Yeah, interesting. Okay, really great. I mean, that number is impressive. Saving 80% on your grocery bill, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask into that. Yeah. Okay, great. So do you think that you were more of an overspender or an under earner? And I guess at this point, if you're not working, obviously you're, that question might be answered for you. But where do you see these financial, these money problems came from? What are the source of them in your life, do you think? Yeah, I think a few a few different ways that it came. I kind of grew up feeling always liking new things. I was raised in Saratoga Springs, New York, which is an upper middle class city. You know, I had friends with elevators in their homes and gorgeous expensive tastes everywhere it seems like. So at an early age I really valued those things growing up. And then, you know, once I learned and got credit cards like really early on in life. I think my freshman year of college was when I got my first credit card. I really didn't have the financial education behind me to know how to use those credit cards wisely. I remember growing up, my parents would often, you know, we would do these shopping trips where we would have what my mom would call sick days from school, where we would skip school altogether. And me and my sisters and her would go shopping all day and go out to lunch and get pedicures and everything. But then the next day I would find her doing her budget and she'd be all stressed out and yelling at me that money doesn't grow on trees. So like, I didn't have really much formal education on like, here's a credit card. This is what you do. Now, I think that a lot of times people are born to be a certain way with certain skills. They're born to be impulsive or optimistic. And I find that a lot of people that are spenders are actually really, they're risk takers too. So a lot of people that are spenders are also really good investors because they take a lot of risks with their investors because they don't let money hold them back from life. And so that was the way I was. I was always impulsive. I I love to do fun things and I don't want anybody to you know, take back my life, I guess. I don't let money hold me back. So that's good on in one way, but then in another way, it got me into a lot of debt because I didn't think about the decisions and the purchases I was making. Hillary here with a quick timeout to tell you how we can work together to improve and even make your financial life 100% organized and hassle-free. As a listener, you probably know my story. I made every money mistake in the book until I finally figured out the power of learning how to change my brain, including my beliefs about money. This allowed me to multiply my wealth to over eight figures. And since then, I've created a done-for-you comprehensive course to teach other business owners exactly how I did it. I've also been a wealth and financial advisor to women and couples for more than 20 years now. If you think we may be a great fit to work together, go to hillaryhendershot.com and just start a conversation. We provide fee-only fiduciary advice to our clients, which means our clients never ever pay commissions. And we do only what's in your best interest, just like it's supposed to be for all financial advisors. If you want to see how my team and I measure up as financial advisors, check out our Yelp reviews at hillaryhendershot.com forward slash Yelp. All right, let's get back to the show. And so in terms of being a risk taker, you're self-identifying as a risk taker, imagining just from what you've told me about your husband that he maybe doesn't identify the same way. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. Okay. He plays it very safe. So how are things going between the two of you as you're paying things off and you're taking more risks? How are you navigating that? Yeah. So 
that's a really good question because I think a lot of times in a relationship, you know, opposites attract. And so for me, I'm a risk taker. I, I'm a big thinker. I'm impulsive. He like likes to sleep on every decision. It takes him a long time to make a decision. When he makes a decision, it's really conservative. A lot of times he's fearful about making big decisions. And so when it comes to us working together, we actually do very well together because we work together as a team. It's not mm -hmm. Mark versus Lauren. It's our family as a team. And so how it looks like on a day-to-day, -day, we actually, he quit his job two and a half years ago to come home and work with me on our website and our business. And so that was like, unlike him to do that. Totally like, I mean, quit his hundred thousand a year job to come home and work with me. Like it yeah. was, it was crazy, but for us, it was worth it as a family. And we've since been able to make up that income through my business. But for him, he is very good like at the numbers. So if we sit down and we decide, you know, we're working through a project or we're working on our budget together, our business budget or our personal budget, he sits down and he's really good at like figuring out the numbers. So he has, you know, the computer open and he's working through our spreadsheets and figuring out the numbers and figuring out cost per click on ads that we're doing, but also helping us figure out, you know, personal finances and all that kind of stuff. And then I am, I, I use my spending skills now to, <laughs> to be the one in the family that spends the money, but spends it wisely. So I do all of our grocery shopping. I do a lot of our, I do all of our media for the business. So I'm out in front of people and I'm having to book flights and, and do all these television appearances. And then I also, you know, know what to buy for gifts for people and, and, you know, how to run the household efficiently. So our skills are really complementary to each other, but we just had to learn how to use them together so that we weren't fighting all the time. It's great. You guys sound like a very constructive couple. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Did either of you discover or illuminate any superstitions about money, things that you used to think were true that you either now no longer subscribe to, or you had to even bust through as an assertion or, or a superstition? Yeah. I think for me, I started really understanding, you know, money, obviously money doesn't grow on trees, but I acted like it did for a while. But when I started seeing, you know, I never knew the what compound interest was or any of those kind of things or, you know, how investing could really help us. Those were all things that I kind of had to learn along the process. And Mark has always been very good with learning how to save and invest. But for me, it was all kind of brand new information. So I started changing the way that I thought instead of a mentality of being stuck and being depleted with my finances to an abundance mentality of like, investing and saving and seeing my money grow. And so that was a big mm -hmm. thing for me to, to learn, you know, as a spender, I love to spend all of our money, but you know, I'm not just spending money. I'm actually losing money when I'm making those purchases. And so, because I can't yes. invest it. And so that was like a big turning point for me through this process to learn those kind of skills as well. Awesome. What about for Mark? Can you speak for him or I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, it's fine. I think for Mark, he really had to learn that, especially running a business together, that you have to take financial risks and investments in order to make more money. And that was really, really hard for him because like I said, he would rather sit and be really conservative with our money. And so it was, it was hard for him at first to be able to invest money that we weren't sure we were going to get back. But he's had to learn to be a little bit more trusting of his gut. And that's really helped him with investments and also just in our business to be able to make those big risks to make extra money. Struggle really produces growth, doesn't it? It really does. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so you have not only, well, how long did it take you to pay off the debt? Two years. Took you two years to pay off the debt and you went, became a fully entrepreneurial household mm -hmm. and you have done a lot of media and a lot of publishing. What do you think is the thing you've done that produced the most results? Oh, I think that the thing that's produced the most results has been sharing my personal struggle through my website, laurengroupman.com. That's how I got the book deal. That's how I got the television. If that didn't come before the website. I think what I've done really well is taken my story and my struggles and really been able to share it in a way that's relatable to other people. And I think anybody can relate to the feelings that I share in my book and in my podcast and, you know, in my, um, on my website that I think has been the 
the central glue of holding the business together. And then all the other little side things that I do, I'll point back to that hub, that main hub of the website. What's been the most surprising thing that you learned along the way? Ooh, for entrepreneurship or getting out of debt? About money. Okay. The su- most surprising thing about money that I've learned... It could be about entrepreneurship if it's right there for you too. Yeah. I think the most surprising is, is that money isn't just money. You know, Money represents the lifestyle that you want to live, the where you, you know, what you want to drive, what you want to wear, your relationships with people that, you know, before I just saw money as a ways to get things that I want, but it really is kind of a reflection of how your, you know, your values, like we talked about before and where the things that are important to you are that it's not just money. It's, it's everything. It kind of encompasses everything in life. And for years I didn't think that I really thought it as just money. So now I see it as a means to get, you know, to, enhance my future to be able to do the things that I want to do with my family, but yet still remain debt free. And and that's been really surprising to me. I love that. All of us who've been to our own financial rock bottom have, I kind of refer to it as a spirituality about money. Yep. Like it is not just money. (laughs) So I think you put that really well. And so let's talk about budgets and paying off debt. Speaking about this book that's coming out, what do you think goes wrong with most people's spending plans? Well, I think that people don't plan enough or don't plan accordingly. So I think a lot of times people set this budget or, you know, whatever the spending plan, whatever you want to call it. And they set it up and they just like set it on autopilot. Right. So, and then it should just go month after month after month. But I find that things come up every month and I need to set a budget for every month individually. So I think a lot of people don't do that. They don't budget for every single month. I mean, for me, I have, Oh gosh, how many nieces and nephews? I think I have 18 nieces and nephews under the age of 10. I mean, there's oh my goodness. There's a ton of them. So we have like three birthdays a month. So every month I need to be able to plan whose birthdays it is, what kind of gifts I have, you know, what vacations we have, what if we're going back to school, what school supplies we need. We have to plan that out all the time. And if I did one budget and just expected to stick to it every month, I would fail. And so for me, it's planning every single month differently and sitting down. We have what we call the budget night. So the last Sunday of every month, we sit down, Mark and I, and we plan our month out for the business and for for the family. And it really helps us kind of stick to it and stay in communication together. What do you say to someone who hears the word budget and their eyes roll back to the back of their head? (laughs) <laughs> well, there's either two reasons why. The number one reason is they're a spender and they don't. It makes them cringe on the inside, which is what used to be happened to me. And then the second reason would be I make so much money, I don't need to budget, right? So I think there's two different ways, reasons why somebody would roll their eyes. And for both, I think it's the same thing is that you have to realize that, you know, if you don't tell your money to go, you're going to overspend it. And if you're, if you value your money, then I would say, let's, you know, let's spend it wisely. Even if you have a lot of money or a little money, you still need to to budget and tell your money to go so that you make the most out of it. And I think that that's what I would say to somebody is, you know, by not doing anything and not doing a budget, you're making a choice to not have control of your money that month. And so by having a budget, it just helps you have control of your money and tell it where to go. And so do you practice... By the way, it's just a sidebar. There are people who naturally underspend, by the way. <laughs> They're mm-hmm. rare. <laughs> They're rare, but they are there. You're right. They exist. So do you practice the bucket or envelope method or do you have a dense spreadsheet or do you use YNAB? How do you do it? Yeah. So we actually have an online course called the Financial Renovation. And inside that course, we developed budgeting tools ourselves. So like oh, great. easy drag and drop budget tools. It's an online system. So we use that. I use cash for a lot of things, but I'm a kind of a paper person. So I use a planner called the Personal Finance Planner, which is something that we developed a couple months ago. So it's like a planner that's also a budget tool, uh-huh. like a paper planner. So I, I use that personally to keep track. And yeah, so Mark does have spreadsheets, but I don't use them because that's not how I operate. I, I just like the paper. This book is called The Recovering Spender. Mm-hmm. Said kind of like people might call themselves a recovering alcoholic. Do you think you'll <laughs> always be a spender? Is that why the title is what the title is? Yeah. It's not the recovered spender. For right. 
Right. So I think that I just had to realize that I have a natural tendency to spend money because I like spending money. I mean, I, like I said in the beginning, I don't see money as a hindrance. I see it as a tool and I don't like letting money dictate how I live my life. But that being said, that there are certain things that I want to do, which is have the retirement, have, you know, nice vacations, have the kids go to college that I really invest in those things. And I would rather do those than blow all my money at Target or Hobby Lobby. And so for me, I have to choose, you know, where to put my money. And if I go into Target or Hobby Lobby, despite having all of these other goals, a lot of times I get sucked into the ambiance or whatever, the beauty of the stores. And so I still struggle. You know, if I go into a store, I have to know my boundaries. But if I, and if I don't budget, I'm like, you know, a kid in a candy store. I just want everything. So it's really important for me to budget and stick to it. And it really helps keep my spending under control. So as an aspiring author in the financial space, and you have authored s- several other books, and we'll link to those in the show notes for this episode. By the way, Lauren will talk more about some of the things she's offering about the book that's launching now in a few minutes. But if you want to find out more about Lauren, just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 38. So Lauren, as an aspiring author in the financial space, the one thing that is almost universally said about money is that you know, it's probably already been written. Like there's nothing new under the sun. And ultimately budgeting is just spending less than you make. Yet you have the courage to write and share your story about getting into and out of debt, which frankly is the situation for millions of people. I mean, it seems like this unending process Mm -hmm. of people coming into their mid twenties and getting into debt and then discovering this entire world of recovered spenders, just like you. What makes this book different? I think exactly what you said that makes this book different is that there are so many financial books out there and they speak a lot of times to the people that love money, the people that want to, you know, do better with money. But there's never been a book that has been written by a spender to a spender because I think that we speak a different language. You know, we're the black sheep in the finance world when it comes to money. You know, we sit in the back of the class with our heads hung low thinking that, we're just never going to do well. I mean, I'm not talking about spending. People like to shame spenders. Exactly. They, they like to shame us. They like to yell at us and say, you know, you just need to stop spending money. But when we talked about earlier that money isn't just about money, it's about a lot of other things. And so it's too simplistic to just say, spend less than what you're making, because there's so much more underneath all of that spending. And I've been there and I know you know, it's not just about money to spenders. It's about security. It's about fun. It's about, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and appearances and feeling like they're not enough. There's so much more that goes into it. And I have yet to read a book like mine that makes a spender feel like they can do this. You know, I've, I've been able to give out a bunch of pre-release copies and the response that I'm getting is I've never read a finance book that I like to read, or I've never Uh, How did you get those words that were in my head and put them down on paper? And so spenders are really relating to this finance book in a way that I don't think that they ever have to a finance book before. That's great. Mm -hmm. So the book is titled The Recovering Spender, How to Live a Happy, Fulfilled, Debt-Free Life. Did I get that right? Yep, you got that right. Okay, so that's a really bold promise. Yeah. So (laughs) what are the top tips you want to share with my audience for them to disconnect spending from happiness and experience fulfillment now? Yeah, I think we talked about things like defining your values. But another thing, you know, decluttering your life to regain your joy again. A lot of times people surround themselves with all of this stuff. And this stuff is actually, you know, sucking them dry of all of their joy. And so one of the chapters that I talk about is how to declutter your life to regain your joy and ways to make money from the things in your house, but also just how to, you know, properly clean your life up and your finances up so that you have that joy and freedom again. I talk about ways to organize your finances in a way that makes sense. And a lot of, you know, the second half of the book is broken down almost, you know, like I said, as a 12 step process. So we talk about how to set up a proper budget as a spender. We talk about how, to pay off your debts in the best way. So this is kind of like a beginner 
you know, if you've, if you failed at budgeting in the past and never been able to stick with it, it would be a great book for you. But it also would be a great book for anybody that works with people that are spenders so that they can understand how to help them. Because it's, you know, for a spender, if you've ever wondered, why aren't you, can't you just stop spending money? It's not that easy. And so I think this would be a great read for somebody like that as well. That's really great. So some of the things we've talked about, reducing your grocery bill by 80% mm-hmm. and actually how to do that, like actual tactics. For that, go to laurengrootman.com. But if folks want to get a copy of this book, what do you want them to do? Yeah, they can go to laurengrootman.com. They can also go to the recoveringspender.com. That kind of has a few videos about the book, including a spendervention, which we did. Before the book came out, I went and did a documentary using the principles from the book on a family and walking them through three months of my process. And so you can watch those videos on the recoveringspender.com, but it's not, you know, it's that's like a reality show. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a little mini reality show. That's Um, hot. Yeah. So we did that. And then they can, you know, order the book on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's, It's wherever books are sold and check it out. That's awesome, Lauren. Thank you so much for sharing so openly with my audience. I'm excited about what you're doing and hope to stay in touch. As we wrap things up here for today, I need to review with you the things I have to disclose as a fiduciary financial advisor offering wealth management services through my firm, Hendershot Wealth Management, LLC. You should know that the opinions I express on Profit Boss Radio are my own and they can change. The content I provide in the show is for general education. It's not intended as specific investment advice, nor do I recommend any specific financial products. Unlike how I roll at home with my husband, I can't guarantee that my statements, opinions, or forecasts are always 100% right. Of course, I wish I could peek into that proverbial crystal ball, but so far I haven't found it. Past performance is not indicative of future results. I talk a lot about indexes and I want you to know you can't actually buy an index because of course when you take a list of companies and create a product that allows people to invest in those companies, there are fees and expenses involved that reduce returns. Remember, all investing involves risk, which as you know, means you could lose your money. And I have to tell you that there is no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. And that should keep my lawyers happy. Have a great day.